Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Beautiful evening out here on a Saturday. I'm afraid uh, my young assistant can't be with me tonight. She's um, engaged otherwise. So I'm not going to be continuing to read the C.J. Cherry, I mean, yeah, the Earth's Old of Wind. I'm not going to continue to read that until probably Monday with her. Um, but I did want to do a, a video today again about my favorite subject, the scholastic debate and about the play Hamlet by William Shakespeare. I had an interesting little exchange the other day with two young people where I work who both want to become English teachers and I encourage them mightily because we need more good teachers. But um, they both wanted to be teachers and they both said they hated Shakespeare. I did not engage them immediately, but I thought, hmm, hate Shakespeare and want to become an English teacher. How now, brown cow? Excuse me while I plug in the microphone. It seems to be difficult to become a teacher of English and hate the man who created about a third of the English language um, and whose sentiments are as astounding as William Shakespeare's are astounding. I think that Shakespeare, yeah, well, he has so many good things one can say about him, but one of the things you can say about him is that he put voice to one of the most fundamental issues, I think, of human existence. He in, incarnated this struggle that we have mentally as humans um, in, in many of his plays. Not all, because you can't, I mean, there are some plays you can't say, oh, well, that embodies the nominalist and realist thing. It doesn't. It's just a comedy. But some of his comedies do embody it. I think Twelfth Night embodies the nominalist debate, nominalist realist debate. I certainly think that other plays, for instance, like Henry V and Romeo and Juliet and The Tempest and uh, Hamlet um, all and Macbeth all embody this problem, this struggle to some degree. Now, there are a lot of good things one can say about Shakespeare. I mean, he, he embodied mores of his times. He, he had the issue of power and of um, violence and of women's rights and of minorities' rights, like in uh, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. He, he embodied so many different things in his work that you can't really pin him down and say, this is it. This is the, the only thing he talked about, because he talked about a great many things. And his plays, Shakespeare's plays, are a treasure trove of understanding what it means to be human. One of the people I talked to, one of the people I had this exchange with the other day, did say that she wanted to become an, a teacher of English because she had had so many bad teachers before. And she wanted, she wanted to do it right. And I said, more power to you, sister. I mean, that's the way to go. Uh, that's why I, one of the reasons I went into teaching is because I had so many bad teachers. Now, I had good teachers, too. Mind you, I had many good teachers. But every time I came up against a bad teacher, I thought, oh, I can do a better job. And so that's why I went into it. And I think that her uh, zeal for wanting to set the record straight uh, is, is admirable. She also said, this young lady also said, that she thought that literature was a language for understanding ourselves. More than philosophy, more than, than mathematics, more than science. Now, I can't speak to the science and mathematics part. I'm not a scientist or a mathematician, although I love both disciplines. I can't speak really to the philosophy part because I, I think there's a whole portion of philosophy that's kind of navel-gazing. It just went off the, ra the track at some point. But I do think that uh, literature is, in my opinion, one of the best ways for understanding who we are. Literature is like philosophy with its clothing on. You know, literature wears big boots and wanders around the world, um, going up and down, to and fro. I think that when we read literature, it forces us to reflect on ourselves and, and how we fit into the story, but also how we fit into the world. That's that fourfold method that I've talked about before, that Dante Alighieri writes about in his letter to Can Grande. Because literature, when we interpret literature, we interpret it on four levels the literal, the allegorical, the tropological, and the anagogical. That fourth level of interpretation, the anagogical, is how does this 
affect me personally and my spiritual growth and my, my life as a human being. And, and really, that's where we come to know ourselves. How would I react in this situation? What would I do in this situation? How does this give language to what I go through? And I think Shakespeare, uh, of all the writers in English literature, is probably the most prominent writer to do exactly that. I don't think there's anyone who is his equal in, in this vein. His words, his craft with words, is, is unsurpassed by any other writer before him or after. And I also think that Shakespeare was probably one of the best creators to embody this fundamental problem of the scholastic debate. So when they said that they hate Shakespeare because he's a dead white male and he represents the patriarchy, I thought, oh, Lordy, you children. <laughs> but I didn't take up the debate with them, knowing that discretion is the better part of valor. Um, I, I didn't take up the debate with them, but I thought, well, we, we could have a long, drawn out discussion, youngsters. And you will learn the error of your ways and you will come to see what I see. <laughs> Ain't necessarily so. But I did want to do a little bit of talk about tonight about um, Shakespeare and his embodiment of the scholastic debate and talk a little bit more about what the debate entails. I have mentioned it before when reading Romeo and Juliet and have maintained that Romeo and Juliet is an embodiment of that scholastic debate. It's not the only embodiment because there are other plays that do so. Most of us, however, don't think on the one hand that we can understand the scholastic debate because it's so highfalutin. Like most philosophy, it's this is way, way up there. We're just ordinary people. We don't we don't think about these things on a daily basis, right? And most of us, I hate to say it, think that it happened in the 13th century long ago. Way back there. What could it possibly mean to us in the 21st century, right? Well, as to the second question, the second part of the first part of the second part of the first, <laughs> as the second part of the question here, it happened way back there. Yes, yes it did, but I think that what I'm calling the scholastic debate, I maintain, is one form of a debate that has happened since the first monkey stood up next to the monolith. If you get that reference, like my video. <laughs> oh, by the way, Bushmills tonight, folks. It's Bushmills evening, so hope you have your fortification too, because it's going to be a long one. What is this debate? You know, what is it about? I call it the scholastic debate because it is most, in Western, in the Western world, most readily expressed by the scholastic philosophers of that era. But what we have to understand is that our perspective of history, you know, our lifespan on this earth is, is, is 70, 80 years, maybe 90 years, if, we're, if, we, if, if we eat well and you know, do our exercises. Our lifespan is very short. And compared to the, the broad spectrum of history, we see only a narrow window of that history. And, and history is, stretches out way into the past and, honestly, it stretches out into the future, though we haven't seen that yet. Consequently, there are thoughts and ideas and movements in history that have a very, very, very long lifespan. And there are thoughts and movements in history which today, 2021, or 2020, what year is it anyway? Thoughts and movements will still affect us even now. And in order to understand where we're going, I think it's important to understand where we've come from, always. I hold that this scholastic debate, for lack of a better word, stretches at least as far back as the reign of Akhenaten in the Egyptian Empire. And we can certainly talk about that at a future date. But Akhenaten, who is a character in, in Egyptian 
theology and Egyptian history who uh, is either a hero or a villain. He's perhaps 14th century BC, right? So I think that this debate, this struggle, has gone on easily for 3,000 plus years and has been the same debate. It only has its immediate roots in the revival of learning that happened after the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West. But its long-term roots go way, way, way back. I see elements even of, of it in Plato and uh, certainly in Aristotle. Shakespeare, therefore, when he writes, and he's writing in the 1600s, right? Or late 1500s, early 1600s. When he writes during his era, he, like every other historical figure, is affected by not just the immediate history, but the long-term history, and then the deep history as well. You see, we have to consider that every, every person, you and I included, is affected by our, our immediate history. You know, we're affected by the history of this COVID virus. And everything we do from now on will have reference to this whole event. Everything we do from now on has had reference for the last 20 years to the event of 2001. And even further back, it has reference to the event of World War II and the dropping of the atomic bomb. In our long-term memory, our long-term effect, we have reference to things that happened in the 1700s with, the, um, with, with the, the rise of reason, of rationalism, called the Enlightenment. And we have reference to the effects of things that happened during the Reformation and during the plague and war years of the 1300s and to the scholastic debate. And our long-term memory, our deep memory, goes as far back as the Greeks and then as far back as the Egyptians and then farther back to Paleolithic, Neolithic men. <laughs> it sounds weird, I know. But you and I in our daily existence are affected, though we don't know it, by what our ancestors experienced back during the Stone Ages, the Paleolithic eras. Now, if that sounds weird to you, I'm sorry, but that's history. You know, so suck it up. Uh, in order to understand where we are then, in order to understand where we're going, it's important to know some of these events and, and, and see how they affect us. Shakespeare, too, was affected by his immediate history and his long-term history and then his deep history as well even though he may not have known it or acknowledged it. Now, in terms of his immediate history, he certainly had knowledge of the shift that had occurred during the Reformation and the break from Rome that Henry VIII had effected and the civil war that Elizabeth won and then the reign of terror that Elizabeth effected upon Catholics and the Spanish Armada and the... Uh, reign then of uh, the short term reign of uh, I think it was Edward and then the longer term reign of King James and so he would have had knowledge of these things he would have knowledge of the gunpowder plot for instance and Guy Fawkes he would have had knowledge of the Black Plague which uh, affected London uh, I think three times during Shakespeare's lifetime he would have had knowledge of the conditions of London the starvation that occurred at one point in, in his lifetime he would have known those things quite intimately, immediately, just as you and I know about the, um, the 911, 2001 911, and just as you and I know about the COVID virus. In his deep memory, we, it's pretty, pretty obvious that he would have had knowledge of the War of the Roses, he would have knowledge of the Hundred Years' War, and he would have had knowledge of this scholastic debate in his deep memory. I mean, long-term long -term memory. And then in his deep memory, which is what he would not have known immediately, he would have been affected by Western culture as far back as the Greeks or the Egyptians. So in order to address what he's doing, I think it's at least important to look at his immediate memory and maybe his long-term memory as well. 
his uh, his long term memory is, I think, grappling with this issue that emerged certainly in the 1200s in the, in the 13th century, called the scholastic debate. And in order to look at that, I, I'd like to I'd like to examine that a little bit more in depth. Now, uh, for those of you who are interested, I'm going to be posting a couple different titles that you can peruse, which are I think they're good explanations of this. Um, they, they delve into more what is this this difference between the nominalists and the realists. The first and foremost of them, I would suggest, you can find on Amazon. I think there's a Kindle version of it. I'm not sure. But this is Joseph Pieper. Joseph, or Joseph Pieper, was one of the philosophers of the great philosophers of the 20th century. And uh, one of the books that was pivotal in my lifetime was Leisure, the Basis of Culture. But he also wrote a book called Why the Lover Sings, and he wrote a book about um, ceremony and religious thought. And he also wrote this book called Scholasticism, Personalities and Problems of Medieval Philosophy. And I'll put a link in Amazon for you, but uh, it's really a wealth of knowledge, a treasure trove of learning about this subject matter, if you're at all interested. One of the things that Pieper points out is that Aristotle's progress through the Muslim world and then through North Africa and into Spain um, hit it, it hit uh, Europe at just the right time and it caused this sort of um, fruit, a fructification of knowledge but also like a, like a, like a bomb hitting uh, an intellectual bomb hitting Europe at the time and Pieper points out that it was it caused such fractioning in the European mind that uh, Europe never fully recovered suggests. One of the major characters who tried to unite the two camps of nominalism and realism was Thomas Aquinas, who, in, who was accused of being a, a nominalist, actually. And his, um, his struggle was to try and unite those two camps, and he did so in several of his books, not the least of which was the Summa Theologia. So if you're interested, Joseph Pieper's Scholasticism, Personalities and Problems of Medieval Philosophy, it's a it's a very good read. I highly recommend it, and I'll put a link into the um, into the descri description below. Another good link, which I'll give to you, I found at Internet Archive, and this is uh, Lynn Thorndike, and she's writing back in uh, the mid twentieth century. So nineteen sixty five is when she died, but this was published in nineteen twenty, and it's about medieval Europe. And Lynn Thorndike has a nice write-up of the whole medieval mind in general and the, and the structure of the medieval world. But she particularly has a good passage, which I'll read here in a minute, about nominalism and realism. A third great title that I would suggest is uh, Charles Beaumont, who is writing in the early part of the 20th century. And his book is Medieval Europe from 395 to 1270. The publication date for this is prior to the war. It's 1902. So there are some things in here that are a little um, arcane, archaic, uh, archaic, but they're worthwhile. And then uh, lastly is a, a, a whole book devoted to scholasticism by Joseph Rickaby, who is writing at the early part of the 20th century. This was published in 1911, and I'm going to read... Uh, a couple passages from him because I think they're worthwhile to consider. I'm also going to include a good link to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a great resource to have for those of you who get into love of wisdom. And they write up uh, about nominalism and about realism. So, And we're also going to look at particularly a passage which has intrigued me. There's a fellow over at the Shakespeare 2020 project, which I do encourage you to check out if you haven't already, who posted about Hamlet, because that's what we're reading right now, that Hamlet has this opening to the play, which kind of sets the stage for the rest of the play. And the opening of the play in Hamlet uh, is, who's there? It's a question by one of the characters, Bernardo, who asks of Francisco, who's there? That seems an innocent enough. But as this poster, this, this uh, uh, member of the group was suggesting, this who's there is actually a connection to the Easter rite. And I thought that's a really, really neat insight. 
Um, this is a connection he suggests to one of the Easter hymns, songs, is it? I guess the Quem Quiritis, Whom Do You Seek? which is sung in churches to remember the visitation of Mary and her associates to the tomb of the resurrected Christ. The Quem Quiritis. I'll have to look up the polyphony for that. And those of you who sing, uh, Quem Quiritis. That's, he suggests that the opening of Hamlet is a trope on that. And I thought that was a great insight. Now, uh, one may object to religious readings of Shakespeare, but Shakespeare's writing in an idiom. Whether he believed in the, the Christian God or not, whether he was Catholic or not, um, whether uh, he, you know, he was um, simply propping up the male hierarchy, as my young interlocutors suggested, those are all sidetrack questions. Shakespeare's writing in an idiom which is Christian, and his audience would have been Christian, and they would have thought about Christianity because they would have been exposed to its mythology on a regular basis. So if he wants to trope something, he would trope what they were familiar with. And what they're familiar with is the Christian idiom, not the Buddhist, not the Muslim, right? Not the Shinto not the, uh, the Hopi Indian. So Shakespeare would take the Christian imagery and trope that. It doesn't necessarily mean he's a definite believer or not a believer, because those are not really questions that are necessary to ask when thinking about him as, as a great artist, at least not immediately. One way or the other, I think the claim that the opening of Hamlet is a trope on this Easter hymn Quem Quiritis, I think it's spot on. Now, I think it's spot on not just because he thought, well, what can I trope? Hey, how about some Christian imagery? <laughs> I think it's spot on because I think what he's troping is the text of the Gospels in order to ask the question about the scholastic debate. Okay? When Mary Magdalene and the others go to the tomb, they don't find Christ, they find an empty tomb. And then immediately after that, Christ appears to Mary Magdalene. And he says, Noli me tangere. Okay, don't touch me, I haven't gone to my father yet. But he's real, he's resurrected, he's risen from the dead. And I think that the whole uh, gist, the whole drive of Hamlet is about whether or not that is real whether or not resurrection, triumph over death, the existence of the incarnation is real. That's, that's what I think. I think the whole of Hamlet is an incarnation of the modern, in Shakespeare's time, the modern struggle with exactly this problem of whether or not the Christ, the incarnation, the divine word is a reality. My father used to say that the question is not whether or not God exists. The question is what we mean by the term God. I, I didn't understand that until I was in my, my 40s. So if, you don't, if, you're, if you're a youngster, you know, if you're in your 20s or 30s and you don't understand it, give it a little time. <laughs> One way or the other. I think that the play Hamlet is embodying this idea of what do we mean by God? What, is, what does that term mean? Okay, And that connects back to the scholastic debate. In order to understand that, I'm going to share with you a couple passages from the authors that I just mentioned. I haven't posted the links yet, so I apologize. They'll be up later, but I'm going to read to you first from... Uh, the author Lynn Thorndike, who's writing during the, um, the early part of the 20th century. And she writes that the dialectic, which is the medieval debating style, the dialectic was based upon the treatise of Aristotle and logic, 
which had been translated by Boethius and Porphyry at the close of the Roman Empire. Teachers and students of dialectic were now exercised over such questions as whether color has any reality independent of the colored objects. In other words, whether we merely have red paint and red cows and red sunsets, or whether there is a redness apart from particular objects, or furthermore, whether there are any ideal beauty and an abstract justice which form our standards in determining whether individual objects are beautiful and whether individual actions are just. Again, men defer in complexion, size, and temperament. Is there any human genus and species which includes them all, or any ideal man after whom they are all patterned? Is humanity a mere collective word, or simply a conception attained by our minds? Such was the problem of universals, agitating the dialecticians when Abelard began his education. Those who regarded such abstract and collective terms as mere names were called nominalists. It's from the Latin uh, nomen, which means name only. So people that held that these uh, things were uh, abstract and collective terms uh, as mere names, they were the nominalists. Those who held them to be true substances, although perhaps substances of an incorporeal and spiritual nature, were called realists because they saw it as connecting to something real. Those who, like Abelard himself, took a medieval course were called conceptualists. All this discussion was a distant echo and revival of the theory of ideas in which Plato, 1500 years before in the Academy at Athens, had instructed Aristotle and his other disciples, and which is still reflected in modern idealism. The theory of spiritual substances was very welcome to the Christian thinkers of the Medi Middle Ages, writes Thorndike, since it confirmed their belief in a human soul separate from the mortal body and in a host of demons and angels. That substance was something distinct from external appearance and particular qualities was also an attractive thought to them. It enabled them to explain that in the sacrament of the Mass, while the bread and wine might retain their outward qualities, such as are apparent to the senses of sight, taste, and touch, yet their inner nature had been transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ. This illustrates what important bearings logic or dialectic might have upon theology. And for Catholics... One of the historical points we have to acknowledge is that the belief in transubstantiation, the real presence of Christ, although it did exist in vestigial form and in, in, in fractions here and there in the culture, really became defined during this era. And it became defined in the 1200s because of this whole debate. So our belief as Catholics, I am Catholic, the, the belief in transubstantiation has its roots in this whole debate as well. Okay, all right, good. Moving on. This is from Bermont, uh, Charles Bermont, Medieval Europe. And he writes about Aristotle saying, the preponderance given to the faculty of theology at Paris is due to the favor enjoyed again by scholastic philosophy, which during half a century had fallen into disrepute. The impetus came from Spain, where a celebrated school of philosophy was formed in the 12th century, in which the works of Aristotle, entirely recovered, were especially studied. It was the school of Cordova, the country of the Muslim Ibn Rashid, otherwise known as Averroes, Motorcycle. Averroes, the learned uh, philosopher in the writings of the citizens of Stagira and of the Jew Moses Maimonides, his disciple, who attempted to reconcile Aristotle and the Bible. One of their contemporaries, Ramond, Archbishop of Toledo from 1130 to 1150, had a Latin translation made of not only the works of these two philosophers, which had a marvelous success throughout the theological world of Europe, but also, most importantly, of the original books of Aristotle. When all the great Greek philosophers thought was given out instead of the abstracts by Boethius or the endless commentaries by schoolmen, 
It was like a new light pouring in upon man's intelligence. Part of what Brahman is, is saying here, and I think this, is how, this makes it a little more clear to us, we had in the West lost the actual physical documents of Aristotle. I mean, you know, when you look at a book now, we'd, we'd hold them as cheap because there's so many of them. But there were only a few books uh, which were really more scrolls, more than codices, right? Scroll versus a codex. There were really only a few books of actual Aristotle in the world itself. And most of them had been lost to the West simply because uh, they physically had been burned or stolen or taken or had otherwise disappeared. So in the West, there was knowledge that there was this great man, Aristotle. But most of our knowledge came from references through the intelligent men like Boethius or Augustine who made their references to those texts. Um, like we make references now, we quote things now. And so in the West, we only knew those, those, those great works of Aristotle through reference, but they, we didn't actually have the physical texts. Okay. And um, most of our Western culture was based on Platonic thought, not only because Plato's works had physical works had survived, but because Plato's influence had permeated through the culture itself, cultural thought, and had infused itself into Christian thought, even into the structure of the mass, as it was, so that Christianity carried on Platonic thought and made reference to Platonic works, but only had a slight memory of Aristotle. When the translations of Aristotle came in their totality, because they, you know, here's Europe, <laughs> sorry, visual, here's Europe, they'd gone around that whole Africa and then up to Spain and then back into Europe again. When they finally came back into Europe in their totality, it was as though it would be like finding a microwave suddenly in a, in a, in a geological dig. You know, you're, you're, you're digging in this ancient city from Roman times and you find a microwave down there. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, how did these people create this thing? That's the, the impact that this had. And Vermont goes on to talk about the influence on other people up through Bonaventure. And he says the first, uh, the two important works of St. Thomas, the Summa Theologia and the Summa Against the Gen Gentiles or the Contra Gentiles, include in their able synthesis the entire church doctrine and philosophical and theological questions. They have not been surpassed after five centuries and are regarded with deserved favor by Catholic theologians. In a period so deeply imbued with orthodoxy and logic, literature and the sciences could not fail to be saturated with the religious spirit. Naturally, it inspired the preachers whose sermons have preserved for us in the midst of pedantic quibbles so many precious bits of information as to customs. It is found also in the writing of scientific men, for if the, Midi if the Middle Ages did not produce any science, they did develop real scientists. And he goes on to name a few of those fellows. And basically he says that the influence of theological and philosophical thought was, was ubiquitous. It was in science, it was in architecture, it was in politics, um, it was in music and, and art. So anything that occurred in the, his, in the theological or philosophical realm had impact that was broad, was widespread. Okay, so here's the third thing that I want to throw into the discussion, which is by uh, this author, Rickaby, Joseph Rickaby. And he's talking about scholasticism uh, more in depth. I'm not going to read the whole passage because it would be tedious. But he says, deferring much among themselves and fighting one another vigorously, the schoolmen of the 13th century still make one school of philosophy and present a united front against adversaries, contemporary and subsequent. They are all orthodox in the Roman Catholic sense. They are all dualists 
not pantheists, idealists, or monists. They are all optimistic, taking a cheerful view of the world and of the com competency of human reason. They're all static or feudal, believing in a fixed hierarchy of beings. The schoolmen were churchmen, faithful to the church they served. Their every page testifies to their zeal for orthodoxy. If some were less orthodox than others, they were also less scholastic. They speculated with considerable freedom, but always labored to make out their speculations to be in harmony with the teachings of Mother Church, and really at heart desired that they should be so. It would not be fair to accuse any of them of heresy, even though it might appear that this or that utterance pursued through all its consequences, should end in contradicting one or other of the dogmas, dogmas of faith. The author had no mind to follow his statement so far and would not have owned that it led so far. To no author should there be imputed an opinion false or highly absurd unless it be gathered expressly from his utterances or follow evidently from his utterances. These are the words of Don Scotus. So he suggests... Rickaby suggests both nominalists and realists were orthodox. They followed the teachings of the church and they tried their best to support the church. So the debate never was about whether there was a God or wasn't a God. In fact, both camps probably would have recoiled at the idea that there was no God. They probably would have recoiled at the person who proclaimed that there was no God. And like many of the the, the, the men of later generations, even up to the American Revolution, the founders of, the, of America, they would suggest that the atheist is a dangerous person because the atheist is somebody who rejects even the possibility of the deity. They don't even try to attempt to, to understand what that means, what the deity means. These men of the 1200s would have recoiled at the idea of an atheist as well. And they, they, both of them were thinking not whether there was a God or wasn't a God. They were thinking, what does that mean? When we talk about the God, what do we talk about? When we talk about color, what do we talk about? When we talk about birdness, what do we talk about? I think, therefore, when we look at somebody like Shakespeare, who, of course, is later, but still is within that tradition, when we look at somebody like Shakespeare... He's not saying that there is or isn't a God. He is suggesting that to believe that God is this or to believe that God is that has consequences that end up in one way or the other, if that makes sense. So, for instance, like in, the, in, in Romeo and Juliet, to believe that God is order and patience and long-suffering and um, providential allows us to endure great, great tragedy and hardship and suffering. To believe that the God is um, fortune, chance, accident, um, that, that basically plays dice, is really to have a, a very weak, Shakespeare suggests, a very weak basis for our own lives. It makes a pointlessness of life, Shakespeare seems to suggest, so that we begin to look for another thing to focus on. Women, power, um, entertainment, materialism. And that's why Romeo ends up not only becoming enslaved to Juliet, but then killing himself at the end. Now here's a last thing just to throw in, just so we can define what this debate seems to be about. This is from the Stanford Encyclopedia in Philosophy. They suggest that nominalism comes in at least two varieties. In one of them, it is the rejection of abstract objects. In the other, it is the rejection of universals. Philosophers have often found it necessary to postulate either abstract objects or universals, and so nominalism in one form or another has played a significant role in the metaphysical debate since at least the Middle Ages, when versions of the second variety of nominalism were introduced. The two varieties of nominalism are independent from each other, and either can be consistently held without the other. 
However, both varieties share some common motivations and arguments. They go on to say then that nominalism, the word, is used by contemporary philosophers in the Anglo-American tradition. In one sense, its most traditional sense deriving from the Middle Ages, it implies the rejection of universals. In another, more modern but equally entrenched sense, it implies the rejection of abstract objects. To say that these are distinct senses of the word presupposes that universal and abstract object do not mean the same thing. And in fact, they do not. For although different philosophers mean different things by universal, and likewise by abstract object, according to widespread usage, a universal is something that can be instantiated by different entities, and an abstract object is something that is neither spatial nor temporal. Hmm. Okay. Thus, there are at least two kinds of nominalism, one that maintains that there are no universals, one that maintains that there are no abstract objects. Realism about universals is the doctrine that there are universals, and Platonism is the doctrine that there are abstract objects. Okay. There are universals. Here's my take on it. If you're a philosopher, feel free to correct me. Nominalism suggests that we look around us at objects and we tend to group like objects with other like objects. And so that we can understand how to operate in the world, we give names to objects that appear similar to us. So, for instance, if I have a cup, the cup is of a certain shape and is used to contain a liquid. And if I have another cup, a taller cup, cup, bigger cup, it is also of a certain shape and used to contain a liquid. Both are cups, even though they have a different shape. And that abstraction, then, is an abstraction from certain entities of the physical form itself. Both can be used as cups, whether it's a boot or a hat or a large mug or this whiskey glass here, this whiskey cup. But both are cups. And the word is itself a tool used in order to be able to say, I can use this in order to contain liquid. If there were a tube with a hole in the bottom where the liquid would just drain through, that wouldn't be a cup. That'd just be a tube. And to claim it was a cup would be stupid because the minute I put my whiskey in there, it would pour onto my lap and be a waste of good bush mills. But if I were to put a an object at the bottom, something to block the liquid from pouring out, I have a cup. And I can abstract from this object and this object and say, this is a cup and that's a cup. The nominalist would suggest that the word is merely an abstraction in order to understand one object is similar to another object, and one object is different from another object. The second part of that is then that if I have this cup and this cup and a third cup, do I have a cupness? Is there a universal form of a cup? And nominalists would reject the idea that there is a universal cupness. They would reject on the on, on the one hand that when one is abstracting from this cup and this cup over here, that there's any reality to that abstraction beyond the fact that we're describing two objects that operate the same way. Okay, there is no, there is no, there is no cupness ab abstraction. And then they would object to the idea that there's an abstraction to higher and higher levels, to thingness itself. That's my understanding of nominalism. So for the nominalist, the nominalist isn't saying there is no God. What the nominalist would say is that the term God represents something that we are dealing with in this world. And to believe that that is a reality, to believe, in other words, that whatever we mean by this term is, is, is a reality, 
is as though we were saying to believe gravity is a reality. That when you fall down, that when you jump off a building, you fall down. That's a reality. When the sun rises, it rises and there's light. That's a reality, right? It's a reality of human life. It's a reality of human life that when you grow old, you eventually die. That's a reality. Those realities, though, uh, we deal with using words. And whatever the reality is that we deal with when we use the word God, that's a reality for the nominalist. But the nominalist is not saying that there is no reality to whatever this phenomena is. The, reality, the, the, the nominalist is saying that that reality is so huge, so immense, that we, we lump it into a single word. I would speculate that whatever the phenomena is, it has to do with our own dealing with our weakness, dealing with our humanity, our mortality. That maybe we can go so far as to say, like Walker Percy does, it's dealing with our own consciousness. Maybe. When we talk about, for the nominalist, right? Because we're still in that camp right now. For the nominalist, when we talk about the word God, what we're talking about is like what Walker Percy says, the, the, the peculiar fact that human beings look in a mirror and see a reflection rather than another human. The peculiar fact that humans wear clothes. The peculiar fact that humans like to talk with one another and use language. The peculiar fact that humans are born, grow up, suffer, and die. The peculiar fact that humans laugh, that we're the laughing animal, as Aristotle suggests. These are peculiar phenomena. And they're so immense to deal with it. It's so immense, right? If you were to say, look, I am, what am I, what are you dealing with? Wait, what are you dealing with, Johnny? What I'm dealing with is the fact that I recognize that I'm dealing with this. <laughs> And it's so immense that instead of saying I'm dealing with the fact that I have a body, that I have a consciousness, that I have emotions, that I have suffering, that I'm going to die, that, I'm, that I am uh, physically limited, that she doesn't love me, that I can't do things right, that I have constant guilt. Instead of saying that, what we say is, according to the nominalist, we say God. And the term encompasses this immense thing that we call the human experience. But for the nominalist, it's limited to this world. And for the nominalist, there is nothing beyond this world. There's no big grandfather floating in the sky, so to speak. Now, they're not atheists. We have to make that distinction. Nominalists are not atheists. They don't say there is no God, because that would be akin to saying that there's no human experience. And that's a BS, because we wouldn't be here at all. There is a human experience. And it involves laughing and suffering and living and dying, you know. And, and that experience is so immense that for most of us, we can't handle it in toto, according to the nominalist. And so we throw ourselves upon an external one could say a projection, but I think that's pejorative. We throw ourselves upon a, a term that allows us to somehow deal with the immensity of our own existence. And that term for the nominalist is God. The young interlocutor that I was speaking with who said that she didn't like Shakespeare also said, and I don't know why she said this, because it, it was unsolicited. I find it interesting that atheists frequently tell me they're atheists without my asking. I mean, I don't go around saying, hi, I'm a Catholic. Hi, my name is Lassiter. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> I don't know many Christians that do. Uh, she told me she was an atheist and that she thought Shakespeare was uh, propping up the male patriarchy and that he was just a dead white male himself. And that she hated him. She hated Shakespeare. Well, you know, that's two points of discussion for future reference. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty jacked about that because that means I have two things I could talk with her about. 
<laughs> and this other fellow expressed similar sentiments as well. But in, in reflecting on it, as I was thinking about this later, I thought, I don't know whether or not even now atheists that say they're atheists are really atheists. I think that what they're doing is the nominalist thing in its extreme form. They're rejecting what they think is God. They're rejecting the flying grandfather in the sky. The, 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 uh, the what is it, the spaghetti monster, the flying spaghetti monster, the pastafarianism, right? Being touched by his noodly appendage and all that. They're rejecting that. What they wouldn't reject, because I don't think it's possible to do so without becoming insane, is that they're not re uh, rejecting the fact that human experience is complex, that it's immense, that it's filled with suffering and joy, that is bewildering, and sometimes, well, frequently, that it is beyond our capacity to fully comprehend it. I don't think they would reject that. And perhaps if they knew that that's what the nominalist saw God as, they might say, I'm not an atheist. I, I, I believe that there is a God. What the nominalist doesn't re recognize or, doesn't, or refuses to recognize is that that term has connection to something beyond this world. They, they, re they reject the idea that God is a being himself distinct from you and I, or that God is um, floating around somewhere up there. You may say that's a straw man argument, that, that that's not what people really believe. But they reject that any of our abstractions have connection beyond this world. Okay, so keeping that in mind, let me turn. If I, can I be quick about anything? I ask my former students, is Mr. Lassiter quick or brief about anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me turn briefly to the realists. And this is again from the, uh, the Stanford um, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And they say, according to metaphysical realism, the world is as it is, independently of how humans or other inquiring agents take it to be. The objects the world contains, together with their properties and the relations they enter into, fix the world's nature and these objects exist independently of our ability to discover they do. Unless this is so, metaphysical realists argue none of our beliefs about our world could be objectively true, since true beliefs tell us how things are, and beliefs are objective when true or false, independently of what anyone might think. Many philosophers, philosophers believe metaphysical realism is just plain common sense. Others believe it to be, like G.K. Chesterton, for instance. Others believe it to be a direct implication of modern science, which paints humans as fallible creatures adrift in an inhospitable world not of their making. Nonetheless, metaphysical realism is controversial. Besides the analytical question of what it means to assert that objects exist independently of the mind, metaphysical realism also raises epistemological problems. How can we obtain knowledge of a mind-independent world? There are also prior semantic problems, such as how links are set up between our beliefs and the mind-independent states of affairs they allegedly represent. Then the article goes on to say, metaphysical realism is the thesis that the objects properties and relations the world contains exist independently of our thoughts about them or our perceptions of them. Anti-realists either doubt or deny the existence of the entities the metaphysical realist believes in or else doubt or deny their independence from our conceptions of them. Now, what that suggests then about realism and the uh, the academic realists of the 1200s especially, is that they held that our abstractions are not mere convenience to survive in the world. The men of the 13th century, and they're mostly men, by the way, so I'm just going to say men, because you know, there were a few great women uh, composers and artists of that era, but this debate was primarily between these scholastic men. The men of that era 
that were the realists held that when we talk about cupness, right, the abstraction cupness, that there really is a connection to something beyond this world, some pattern, some order, some structure. And not just for the cup, but for color or sound or shape, abstract shape, like, you know, circle. They held that that our world is itself a physical incarnation or embodiment of a tremendous pattern, a pattern that preceded the world and is beyond this world, but which the world follows. And so when we operate in the world, when we deal with the world, there is a right and a wrong way to do so. Because we're either conforming to that pattern or we're rejecting that pattern. And if we reject that pattern, according to the, the realist, if we reject that pattern, we suffer, we, 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 we grow dissolute, we fall into um, horrendous actions. What we refer to in the Christian world as sin. And the ultimate end of that then, of rejecting that pattern, is that we become bitter and angry and violent and hate everything around us, including ourselves. And that ultimately then when we die, and that gets confirmed, we have a, don't have a chance to change, we become incorporated into the pattern, but we become incorporated as hating that pattern and hating ourselves. And that that situation or that state of being after we die is called or referred to as hell. Different from Gehenna. Gehenna is the, the pit of darkness where everything just dissolves, obliterates. The, the realists of the 13th, 13th century maintained that if there is no pattern beyond this world, then there is no right or wrong. There is no afterlife of punishment or reward. There is no... Um, reason for our loathing of ourselves and the world around us when we reject that pattern. Nor is there any hope for us to have joy and uh, autonomy uh, and, and um, uh, freedom of thought if we are to accept the pattern. The realist holds that that pattern, which they refer to as the logos, that that pattern is absolutely essential to living a life that is full and rich and bounteous. To reject that pattern, or even to reject its existence, is to begin to drift into, or to fall into, dissolution that results in hell. To accept that pattern is the only course, according to the realist, to self uh, uh, autonomy, uh, freedom, light, joy, which is referred to as heaven. So for the realist, words are extremely important. Saying the right words at the right time. Finding the right words. Attaching the right word to the right object. It's extremely important. Because those words correspond to a reality which is part of that logos. Make sense? For the realist, then, to change a word would be very dangerous. A word of any prayer or any poem or any speech would be dangerous. That's how important it was. The Jewish culture, the realist Jewish culture, took this so severely that they saw uh, the, the printed word as holy. You didn't touch the printed word except for with a golden finger. And early Christians held that to translate something into another language was an extremely dangerous attempt. And it was only given to translate to certain individuals to do this. Like uh, when Jerome is given the task of translating into Latin, it is not a small task that he's given. He's charged with the salvation of every soul that reads his text, which is a huge, I mean, that's a huge responsibility. The only reason they would do this is because they held that translating something from one language to another 
can have the effect of falling away from the actual pattern, the actual logos. Every translator is a traitor, right? And so when you translate from Greek into Latin, which is what Jerome was doing, you might betray the actual meaning of the word. And if we scoff at this or laugh at this, think about this. How much of our current situation in English, reading the scriptures, how much do we lose in, ter- in interpretation because we don't know the original Latin or Greek or Hebrew? Well, the answer is a lot. There's a great deal that we lose. So there is, I think, some merit to what the realists are saying. Language is important. The realists would also suggest that language is the, is the medium by which we convey ideas, we explain or outline things, we persuade people and move crowds or individuals to action. Therefore, every word we say is important, it's significant. And crafting the right words at the right time is significant for the realist. I think that that there's some merit to that too, because when you look at how much uh, a great speech can affect people, or a great movie can affect people, or reading a great book can affect people. You know, if you read a great book, a great work like A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller Jr., for instance, or um, Kristen Lavren's Daughter, you know, or if you read um, A Silence by Shisako Endo, those books uh, have incredible power. And I would think it would be very um, dangerous to say that altering the words of those books or altering the endings of those books doesn't matter. I, I have a great memory. When I first saw the movie, The End of the Affair, I thought it was a great movie. Very sad, very tragic. And I went to my friend and mentor and boss at the time, William Walker, and I said, I love this movie. And he said, oh, he, he and his wife, they hated it, hated it. I said, really, why? He said, have you read the book? And I said, no. And so I went back and read the book. And it turns out that the book, The End of the Affair by Graham Greene, the ending is totally different in the movie, completely different in the movie. If you've read the book and not seen the movie, you'll understand this next part. Graham Greene's book is about a woman who begins an affair with a man during the war, and the man is killed by a bomb during the Blitz. And she, finding his smashed body, prays to God that if God will bring him back to life, she would give up the affair. And God does. The man comes back to life. And the woman can't tell the man why she is breaking off the affair. But she does so. And she keeps to that. And during the course of the story, it becomes more and more saintly. And the man becomes more and more hateful of God. And at the end, he says, at the end of the book, he says, I do believe in you, and I want you to get the hell out of my life. So he becomes damned, and she becomes blessed. It's a beautiful novel, if you haven't read it, The End of the Affair by Graham Greene. The movie has her go back to him and start the affair again. And continues in that affair till the end of the movie, when she dies. (laughs) It is a totally different ending. And it's not not accidental. The words that Graham Greene uses, the structure of the story, is extremely important. It's a different meaning when you put it into that other context of the movie. You know, when you take a poem, you change a word in the poem, and you've got a different poem. Um, Realists hold that words are extremely important. And they hold that those words are connected to an abstraction, if you will, which is the pattern, the logos. And the logos has a distinct distinct form, which we follow or we, 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 we reject. When Shakespeare goes to write... I think he's embodying these two camps, and he does so frequently. In Twelfth Night, I think you see it in the dualism that occurs over and over again in the play. In Romeo and Juliet, I think it's embodied in the two characters, the two main characters. In this play, Hamlet, I think it's embodied in the character Hamlet himself, who is himself dealing with 
um, whether or not there is anything out there or whether it's simply his own deranged imagination. They all think he's mad. And he himself play acts that mad- madness. He has a father whom he loved who is murdered and taken over by a fake father, his uncle. The rule of the kingdom is. He himself talks about how he would be bounded in a, in a nutshell and consider himself the king of infinite space had he not bad dreams. That is, intimations from another world that maybe there's something out there. He asks whether or not he should kill himself and says, one of the reasons I'm not going to kill myself is that the Almighty has set his cannon against self-slaughter. And maybe there's something else out there. Maybe there's another world. An undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. He himself has uh, come back from the College of Wittenberg. Wittenberg, which was founded in the 1500s, I think early 1500s, I think it's third or second graduating class. One of its main characters was Martin Luther, who goes on to uh, be the principal player in the Reformation and uh, himself was a nominalist. And um, Shakespeare knew that. He was aware of that. And he has Hamlet graduating from Wittenberg College because Wittenberg was a hotbed of nominalism. And, And then you have this whole thing at the beginning. Who's there, right? Which, if my colleague is correct, and if this really is this trope of the quem caritis, which I do think it seems to be, is really asking the question, is there anyone out there? <laughs> is, is the nominalism thing true? Is there a logos? Or is it all just abstractions of the mind, and we are totally alone on this rock of mud? That's some powerful stuff. How can you hate Shakespeare? (laughs) Now, it's powerful stuff, I think, not just because everybody says so and Shakespeare's cool, because he is, but also because what what do we wrestle with in our current era? We wrestle with this exact same problem, I think. I think we still wrestle with the idea that either there has to be this logos, right? And, and things make sense, and we find freedom and autonomy and joy. Or there's nothing out there, and we have to make do as best we can with the government that we have and the uh, improving of science and the improving of um, commerce. That's a huge question even today. And what camp do you fall into, right? <laughs> and it's not just that it's in our own era only it's it's that it's been in every human era every i think every human era has wrestled with this as far back at least as akhenaten why have we always wrestled with it my opinion of that pardon me my opinion of why we've always wrestled with that is because we are rational creatures Rational thought itself is the trap, is the problem. I mean, it's also the solution, right? It's like that T-shirt with, uh, with uh, um, Homer Simpson. Beer is the cause and the solution to all the world's problems. <laughs> Rational thought, in some degree, is the cause and also the solution, I think, of a large majority of our problems. Why? Why? I think it has to do with the process of rational thought. Something of what I'm about to say here, I get from Plato, but also from Walker Percy. When we see an object, I think, we automatically abstract from that object and make an image in our head. Because we can't put the object in our head, you know. We can't put the glass into our head, because it would hurt. So we abstract and put something in our head, which is an abstraction from that object. And the minute that we do so, there is a, like a, a, a break or a lacuna, a space between the actual object and the image that we have in our head of that object. The closer we can get the image in our head to that object, the more accurate the image is to the object the more true 
our perception is. I mean, true is actually an architectural term. It's not really, it's not a, it's not originally a term of philosophy. It's a term of architecture. A true line is a straight line or a line that actually conforms to a level, right? So if we have an, a, an image in our head that is accurate to the object that we're trying to perceive, then it's a true perception. The problem is that we perceive things beyond the physical. And it's hard for us to say, what is it that we're actually perceiving? Are we perceiving something beyond ourselves? Or are we simply perceiving ourselves? And, and I think therein lies the problem of nominalism and realism. The more that we can get our perception to agree with whatever it is that we're perceiving, the more true our perception becomes. But if we fall into the camp of nominalism, the, and we progress during time, I think our perception begins to conform to the idea that there's nothing there, and we think that we're being accurate, we think we're being true. Because everything then confirms that, confirms that, confirms that. And it becomes harder to really see the opposite camp. Okay? I think that if we agree to realism, that our perception grows with the real, with the, with the, um, the logos, or our perception of the logos, as we get older but the harder it becomes to perceive or understand the other camp. And here's where I think it gets really dangerous, because Plato suggests this, and Walker Percy suggests this, and even Thomas Aquinas suggests this, and yet most people reject what I'm about to say. The only real solution to the problem is a tight rope walk between the two camps and holding the two camps at the same time like a balance as you walk the line between them. We are not entirely certain that there is a Logos. But there is a Logos. And we're not entirely certain that there's nothing there. But there is nothing there. And <laughs> that, that holding of the two camps at the same time, those three authors, who, you know, small cheese, right? Plato, Thomas Aquinas, Walker Percy, they suggest that only in holding the two camps are we able to remain sane, right? There's a uh, the Buddhist koan that a bird flies with two wings. I think that's what Shakespeare is wrestling with with Hamlet. Hamlet's grappling with which camp is he in, right? From the very beginning. I mean, even before Hamlet appears on the stage, there's this question. Who's there? Is there anybody in the tomb? Or are we dealing with an empty rock? Is there a risen Christ? Or was there never a Christ at all? What's his solution, you may ask? What's Shakespeare's solution? Because Hamlet's certainly on the brink, right? I mean, he's, he's threatening to off himself with a bear bodkin, a knife, right? A bear bodkin. He's threatening to kill himself, and, except for that the Almighty has fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. He's seen as insane. His girlfriend throws her, herself into the drink. I mean, it's... Hamlet's not in a good way for most of the play. But at the end, when he's about to go into the, the, the uh, duel with Laertes, there's a scene where he says, I think, the uh, quintessential solution to the problem. Or you could say the, the penultimate solution to the problem. I don't know what, what exactly one would say here. And he says, let's see if I can find it here. He's asked whether or not, by Horatio, he's asked whether or not this is a wise idea 
to take up this challenge that has been given to him. And he responds, well, I can't find it quick enough. He responds, we defy augury. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be not now, yet it will come. If it be not to come, yet it is now. And if it be not now, still it will come. The readiness is all. That's powerful stuff, I think. I can't help but think that the solution in Hamlet to the whole issue of whether he is there or not is, is the solution that, that's not ours to debate. What happens, happens when it happens. Our only task is to be ready for it when it happens. I'm reminded of that line out of Tolkien where Frodo says, I wish this had happened during my lifetime. And uh, Gandalf responds, that's not for us to decide. We only have to decide what we do with the time that is given to us. That's some powerful stuff. Well, I hope this hasn't been too boring for you. And I hope that you've uh, enjoyed uh, some of it and uh, gotten uh, some of uh, new knowledge from it. And um, for those of you out there who hate Shakespeare, give it time. I understand. I understand. You'll come to love him. And for those of you out there who don't believe in God, who are atheists, give it time. Give it time. You'll come running to him. <laughs> Whatever he is. <laughs> mm. My friends, I'll see you, I suspect, on Monday. We'll read more of Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Earth. See when my young assistant is able to join me. Uh, until we meet again, uh, I do encourage you to check out the Shakespeare 2020 project. It's a hoot. And also to check out uh, for podcasts. Uh, the one that I've enjoyed the most has been um, the, the Stroud's History of the English Language. Um, and I encourage you to check those out. They're quite good. Um, I'm going to be posting a number of these links in the uh, video here so you can access them later at your leisure. Uh, and also, if you get a chance, check out my Patreon page. Uh, if you're able to contribute, I, I thank you profoundly. My my family thanks you profoundly. So, um if you're able to, check that out. I'll put a link to that as well. Until we meet again, stay safe, stay healthy. God bless you all.